Hello, Alex here, and I've had digital cameras with sensors ranging from 6 to 46 megapixels. And today I want to talk about some of the reasons that you might want to consider buying a lower resolution digital camera over a higher resolution one. Let's get into it. We are in the middle of a quantum leap or a space race in terms of technology used in digital cameras. In 2007, Nikon released the then flagship Nikon D3 with its 12 megapixel full frame sensor, which absolutely blew the market away. And now you have people looking at 50 megapixels and 44, 46 megapixels. It's not that much when you can get 60 or 100 megapixels in your full frame ish digital camera. Two examples being Sony's A7R4 with its 60 megapixel sensor and the Fujifilm GFX 100 and 100S with their 100 megapixel sensors. Yet yeah, they're a bit bigger than full frame, but still. However, despite what the folks in these marketing departments would like you to think, a higher resolution sensor does not automatically mean a better camera. I do want to say in this video, when I talk about a high resolution sensor and a low resolution sensor, I'm talking about two cameras of the same generation of technology. So say you consider the Sony a7R4 and the Sony a7S 3 They have wildly different pixel counts on their sensors, but the overall technology is more or less the same. So you, things like processing power and buffers are not the limiting factor in terms of image quality and general usability of the camera. Obviously, you can take a Nikon D3 from 2007 and it's not going to hold a candle to a 60 or 50-ish megapixel sensor camera from today. Obviously, because everything else alongside the sensor has gotten better during that time. Additionally, when making comparisons, assume we're talking about a lens that is not the bottleneck, optically speaking, and we're talking about shooting at apertures that are not diffraction limited or overly soft. We're talking, you know, broad, general situations where the image sensor is the defining factor, nothing else. The last thing I want to say before we really get into it is that I do want to upgrade at some point in the next couple of years from the 1DX Mark III with its 20 megapixel sensor to an EOS R5 with its 45 megapixel sensor. I've thought about an R3, but I'd probably go for the R5. So as much as I love this camera, I absolutely do. And it's 20 megapixel sensor is perfectly fine for me 99% of the time, there are a couple of situations where the 45 megapixel sensor of the R5 would be beneficial for me. So it's not like this video is hardcore copium or anything. I will move to the R5 in time. I could do it tomorrow if I wanted to, but I'm not in a rush. Many of the people who watch my videos are probably fairly intimately familiar with the idea of adapting lenses from film cameras, like old manual glass, onto modern digital bodies, especially mirrorless cameras. And if you are, you're probably also familiar with the common trend that those lenses don't render too sharply on modern digital sensors, especially rangefinder lenses. But that's kind of a slightly different thing due to angles of incidence and whatnot. There are two main reasons for this. The first is that the film lens is not designed for a digital sensor. And I don't mean that in terms of, well, obviously one is made of film, I mean, Sensors have a sensor stack on the front of them and that thickness causes issues, especially with wide angle lenses. And again, as I said, rangefinder lenses because the rear optical element is so close to the sensor and they're just not designed to compensate or deal with that. And that causes softness, especially in the corner of your images. The second reason is that resolution of film just doesn't match high end digital sensors at all. So a lens that can easily out-resolve, you know, Velvia 50 and Adox CMS 20, which are incredibly sharp 35 millimeter films. When you talk about line pairs per millimeter of resolution, they're, they're like 20 megapixels in, you know, modern digital terms. It doesn't really match up in any sense. They're not designed for 40, 50 megapixel resolutions. So the flip side of that is that if you're using a lower resolution camera, you can get away with using older, in the modern age, less attractive and thus cheaper due to market forces, older film lenses on your camera or older generation lenses without having to fork out as much cash 
and still out resolve your sensor in your lower resolution camera. For example, I have the Mark 1 EF 24 to 70 mm f2.8 lens. I love this lens and I'm going to talk about it more in future. I went to the EF 24 to 105 Mark 2 f4 lens. That lens is amazing. But this is more than good enough. And f2.8 is something that I decided I preferred over IS and that 70 to 105 millimeter range. On a 45 megapixel sensor, that lens will not hold up whatsoever. Adapting this to an R5 would be an interesting test just for the fun of it. But especially at the long end, it's already kind of pushing it on a 20, 24 megapixel sensor. At 46, it's not going to hold up. However, on a 20 megapixel sensor, I can get away with using this lens no problem. Me again from the future, uh, this section did not come out very well, I wasn't nearly as articulate as I would have liked to be, so I'm just re-recording it while I'm editing the rest of the parts of this video. Diffraction is a phenomenon where the physical aperture blades in your optical system interfere with the electromagnetic waves that photons are and cause a softness or smearing of your image by just messing up the paths of those photons. And diffraction happens at every aperture but at very wide apertures where the uh, ratio of the surface area of that circle to its diameter or circumference is very high as in the aperture you know there's lots of space you could have a photon go through in the middle ish where it's not really near the edges and what this means in practice is like f16 f22 f32 on some lenses on like an APS-C or full frame camera it's not going to be very good. Your image quality will suffer. Your exposure will change as normal. Your depth of field will change as normal. But the actual sharpness of your image just completely falls apart. But the general idea is that like with a spatial resolution, a higher resolution sensor is more susceptible to small changes in the image. So it can see diffraction happen sooner, meaning that you will have say for a, a 45 megapixel and a 20 megapixel full frame sensor, two separate cameras. The 45 megapixel sensor might be diffraction limited at f6.3. I don't know the exact number. You can work this out, but I don't care to. It's just for the purpose of demonstration. Whereas the 20 megapixel sensor might be okay to f13, something like that, uh, which means that you can get uh, more of your usable aperture range with a lower resolution sensor. You could get say from an f2.8 lens f2.8 to 13 be perfectly usable on the 20 megapixel sensor but f2.8 to 6.3 only be usable to its maximum potential on the 45 megapixel sensor i mentioned that pixel pitch is a relevant factor here and that's because it's the specifically the pixel size not the quantity that determines the uh, the kind of the onset of diffraction the diffraction limit of your sensor it's just that Within a given sensor size, like full frame, 20 and 45 megapixels, the 20 megapixel sensor has bigger pixels because there's more space for each pixel within that same area. So you'll see um, there's a lot of discussion right now about the Canon EOS R7 with its 30 whatever megapixel sensor, 32, 36, I don't know. Uh, people buy that for its extended reach, the field of view crop factor from the APS-C sensor with the 600 and 800 millimeter RF f11 lenses they have a fixed aperture of f11 which is beyond the diffraction limit of that sensor so you just you cannot get a sharp image out of those lenses on that camera compared to the other rf lenses because you cannot open up the aperture wide enough to actually not be subject to the effects of diffraction conversely this can happen with extremely low resolution and high resolution full frame sensors like i mentioned it's not just a full frame versus aps-c thing but as sensor resolutions for aps-c start to crop creep up as well we're going to see this become more and more of a thing especially with the trend towards slower zoom lenses like 3.5 to 5.6 is now 3.5 to 6.3 or 4.5 to 7.1 that's going to become more of a problem as time goes on This applies both to videography and also photography using electronic shutter or silent mode as so many cameras call it. The actual data readout from your sensor takes a non-zero amount of time. So if your sensor has a lot of pixels or is physically very large, that is a huge factor as well. 
but we're talking about comparable sensor sizes in any of these comparisons. More pixels and more surface area makes a slower readout. Now, I know some of the latest and greatest cameras like the Nikon Z9, whenever it's available for purchase, uh, have an incredibly fast sensor readout speed, but the majority of cameras don't. Most people aren't buying a seven, 8,000 euro camera. So most cameras that most people would be looking at have a much slower sensor readout speed. And what this means is there is a time delay between the top and bottom or left and right of your sensor being read. So a camera with a slower readout speed will suffer from banding and flickering under certain lighting conditions, but also that jello stretching effect that you see when dealing with either fast panning or fast moving subjects in general. With two sensors that are the same size with equivalent sensor technology and processors etc behind them, the lower megapixel count sensor will read out much more quickly than the higher megapixel count sensor. So video focused cameras like the Sony a7S III keep their modest sensor resolution both for various video specific things but also for photography and the jello effect rolling shutter in video you get much better performance than you would with like the a7r4 just because it has more pixels to read out and that takes longer so if you do a lot of video like a hybrid shooter or if you shoot under artificial light a lot like in sports arenas then it might actually be beneficial for you to buy a lower resolution camera over a higher resolution one so that you can get away with a faster readout speed and be less subject to these effects When we talk about sensor resolution, we're talking about the multiplicative product of the horizontal and vertical pixel counts of a sensor. So Sony's a7R 3 for example, has a 42 megapixel sensor with, and I'm not going to pretend I know this, 7,952 by 5,304 pixels, horizontally and vertically respectively. And this is what we refer to when we actually say resolution. We either mean the X by Y count or just the overall megapixel count. That's a different thing from spatial resolution measured in line pairs per millimeter, which refers to the smallest point or splice of detail that can be distinguished. For example, if the pixels on your sensor are 20 microns wide and 20 microns tall, you cannot distinguish between two lines behind the pixel or in front of the pixel that are 10 microns each, a black line and a white line, because the pixel just can't see the difference between them. But if you go for pixels that are 10 microns wide, suddenly you'll be able to see the difference between them and resolve them as a black pixel and a white pixel rather than one larger gray pixel. However, to actually resolve twice as much detail in both axes, you need to double the horizontal and vertical pixel count. And that means you need to quadruple the pixel count of the overall sensor. As much as marketing people would like to tell you that the 40 megapixel sensor in camera X is significantly better, twice as good as the 20 megapixel sensor in camera Y, that's not true. It is capturing twice as much data, but spread across two axes. And that means that it's only actually resolving about 41% more detail in each axis. If you want to truly resolve twice as much fine detail, as in a 3D object, not a discrete line on a chart, that is half the size and that means horizontally and vertically, so a quarter the area, so twice as fine on both axes, you need four times the pixel count. In that case, Sony's a7R4 with its 60 megapixel sensor is only twice as good as a 15 megapixel sensor camera. Now, don't get me wrong, 40 megapixels is still a lot more data to work with than 20 megapixels, and the resulting images will be sharper but it's easy to get lost in the marketing blurb and forget that it's not twice as good, even though they will never directly say that. That's what they want you to think. For example, going from a 50 megapixel sensor to a 60 megapixel sensor could sound like a worthy upgrade, but it's really not. In terms of spatial resolution, I haven't worked it out. It's this much better in terms of percentage improvement overall on a given axis. And that's not really worth it. I just mentioned that the 40 megapixel sensor in hypothetical camera X is going to capture about twice as much data as the 20 megapixel sensor in hypothetical camera Y. So what that means is the files are about twice as big. 
There isn't a directly linear correlation because file types and containers have changed over time. Fine, you know, bit rates are important even in photography. But the general idea is that a lower resolution sensor will produce smaller files. This means they're easier to transfer, such as things like FTP at sports events or just offloading your memory card at the end of the day. And even basic long-term stuff like backing your files up is more affordable if you only have to back up, you know, 500 gigs of files in a year instead of six terabytes from a much higher resolution camera. That kind of thing does matter in terms of backups and the cost of that. And that is something that's worth considering. The other thing about file size is for equivalent processing power, buffer, all that kind of thing, again, a lower resolution sensor can be shot much more quickly. This is why historically your typical sports and photojournalism full frame camera, so the, the Nikon single digit line, the Canon one series and the Sony A9 series, A9 series, have had relatively modest megapixel counts because it means you can shoot them much more quickly. Up until very recently, adding an extra one or two frames a second versus last gen's model on a DSLR has been much easier in terms of the mirror and the shutter than the actual processing power. The general idea was just to keep the overall sensor megapixel count at a modest but perfectly usable level to suit most people's purposes and allow a bit of room for cropping if necessary to straighten or just tighten in a little bit, but also keep the file size as low as possible so that when you really do need the speed, you can go brrr and just take a ton of shots in a fraction of a second. That was a, the most important thing to the kind of people that these cameras were designed for. Not always, but a lot of the time. Again, the Nikon Z9 is a bit of an exception, you know, 40 megapixels, 30 frames a second, only in JPEG, but still, that's a huge amount of data. And I mean, okay, you have that speed and resolution now. Give it five years and we'll have 45 megapixels at 120 frames per second in full resolution JPEG only. I know I'm gonna annoy some people with this, but it, it's true. Now, yeah, there are people who absolutely, inarguably, unequivocally need the maximum resolution. If not, phase one would have gone out of business a couple of decades ago. Yeah, there are people who need it. There are people who benefit from it in many ways. Like I said, I myself am thinking about getting an R5 in the next couple of years. Well, I'm not thinking about it. I'm going to do it. But most of us don't. Like, the... The use case for me getting the R5 is actually very slight. It's not because it's a god amazing eye autofocus. I have most of that in this camera in live view when I need it. It's the resolution specifically, and it's only for one actual case that I might need it. So chances are you don't really need it and you can save yourself some money by buying a lower resolution camera and then just either save that money or invest it in better lenses and accessories. I get sharper images with the 1DX and its 20 megapixel sensor with the 35 and 85 millimeter primes than I ever would have on my Nikon Z7 with the lenses I was using on that, apart from the 105 1.4. That lens is beautiful, but that was a bit of a monster. My point is, you're probably going to be better off overall with a lower resolution sensor and a better everything else. And I'm not just talking about lenses, things like tripods, travel money, that kind of thing can easily be saved just by not buying a really high-end, high-resolution sensor camera. So hopefully I haven't offended too many people with this video, but one day I will be making the opposite video, justifying high-resolution sensors and the benefits of them. That's it, so stay safe, and bye-bye for now. If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at Shaka1277, where I post new pictures every single day. If you like this video and enjoy what I do on the channel, please consider subscribing or checking out my Patreon, where the tiers start at just one euro per month.